We're going to come back now to uh, two of the suttas that we left out at the uh, on the first half, uh, and uh, we're going to look at those uh, and just to use that as a finishing off. Um, Bobby, because I didn't look at the schedule, what is the schedule now for, for from now till the end? So, Sam, okay, same schedule, okay, and then okay, okay, good. So we'll just see what happens. Yeah. <laughs> So, uh, hmm. and uh, so the uh, idea <coughs> in the first half of this, uh, the first part of this retreat was to look at various kinds of perceptions that we can develop, how we can see the world more in line with how the Buddha saw the world. Yeah, that was kind of the, the part of that. Uh, and uh, we had looked at the idea of impermanence, uh, but I also want to look a little bit more at the idea of non-self and what that means. Uh, and uh, to know to do that, uh, we will look at some of the core suttas about non-self. One of those core suttas is the uh, Anattalakkana Sutta, the discourse on the characteristics of non-self, which probably many of you will have heard about. And um, that is found in the uh, Connected Discourses of the Buddha, Kanda Sangyutta, on the five Kandas, uh, number 59. Uh, 59, that's where it's found. Uh, and another sutta, which is really nice about non-self, which I haven't included, uh, maybe we can do that some other time, maybe next year or something, is the Alagad Upama Sutta, the simile of the snake in the Majjhimanika, middle-length sayings, number 22. Uh, that's also very nice. So if you want to read up on non-self, those are the two main suttas on that particular topic. But there are also some minor suttas on the, this topic, and one of these minor suttas is the uh, numerical discourses you see here, AN 604, numerical discourses, the six is uh, uh, Atamaya Sutta, non-identification, or uh, uh, basically uh, not made of that, is literally what it means. Maya is made of, uh, Tongue is that, uh, not made of that. Uh, so you are not made of something. Uh, and that is then the idea of non-identification. Uh. So this is this particular little sutta. So um, let us check it out, as they say here. Uh, see what it has to say here. Uh. Um, hmm. Okay. Mendicant, seeing six benefits is quite enough to establish the perception of not-self, anatta, in all things without qualification. So again, this idea of all things, let me just, let me just check what that actually says in the Pali, because uh, that is always useful. So, all things are not-self. Ah, here we are. Uh, Anoding, that's the, that's the that qualification, yeah, without the difference. Mm. Okay, yeah. So, um, <clears throat> so all things, or sub, subadama, uh, and then anoding is my qualification, so without, uh, without distinction, really. Uh. So six benefits in seeing non-self. And um, these benefits are pretty profound benefits. We'll just have a quick look at them anyway. And uh, if, you, uh, if you can't make heads or tails of them, never mind. We'll just uh, see what they say anyway. I, be, I will be without identification in the whole world. Hmm. Okay. So um, this means that you don't identify with anything in the whole world. Let me just go back to the other sutta. I guess it had, it had a nice translation in the other sutta. I will not be determined by anything in the, in the world. Uh, this is Bhante Sudato's translation. Uh, I'm not sure why I have a different translation. I'm not sure how that happened. Uh, but uh, sometimes random things happen. This is, I consider this one of those random things. Uh, I, don't take any, uh, I don't take any blame for this to happen, even though it is my fault, I don't uh, accept any responsibility here. <laughs> right. 
randomness intrudes. Uh, it's just cause and conditions, non-self happening here. So, <laughs> it's convenient, right? Very handy. This is what I mean. You are, this is kind of this is how I think about things. Okay, these things happen. Okay, I'm not responsible. Good. End of story. <laughs> So I will be ad without identification in the whole world. Yeah, this this idea that um, uh, you're not um, you're not measured by anything. There's nothing in the whole world that uh, you identify with, uh, and uh, not having any identity is kind of a beautiful thing. Yeah? The less identity you have, in a sense, the more free you are. Yeah? The more narrow your identity is, I am this kind of person. I am that kind of person. Yeah? The more narrowly confined you are to be. You know, be just that, and you can't really express yourself outside of those boundaries. Uh, and uh, the deeper your meditation is, the less of an identity you have. Uh, you start to identify with the meditation. You know, when you come to the Brahma Viharas and you and they really work, then you identify with that. You identify with metta, with compassion, and that is like a boundaryless realm. Uh, there's no exclusion. Uh, once you identify, there is you, and there's other people. Uh, and then we fight. Yeah? Identity always leads to fighting. Yeah? You will notice that politicians around the world, they use the idea of nationalism to stir people up. Yeah? So there's us against them. This is the idea of nationalism. And so, um, um, yeah, you can see that how kind of this, we, we are important, our nation matters, yeah? we are the best, or our culture is the most profound, or whatever it is that people say. Everyone is into this idea of national identity. So all kinds of identification leads to me and then others, uh, and then it leads to clashes as a consequence. Uh, and the less identity we have, the less there is of this potential for clashing in the world. Uh, there's less othering, uh, less me and others. Uh, so not being, not having an identity is kind of beautiful. Uh, yeah, it's kind of nice. Uh, you transcend all of the barriers in the world. Uh, I will be without identification in the whole world. Uh, my eye makings will stop. Uh, yeah, eye makings. Uh, this is kind of when you think of yourself, you think in terms of an eye. This is eye making. Uh, it is your perceptions, your thoughts, and your views. Uh, yeah, I am this person. I am that. Uh, I do this, uh, this is me, don't stay away from me, leave a space in between, whatever it is that you think in terms of eye-making. Uh, and you may remember back to the very first sutta as we looked at, uh, we looked at the famous Madhupindika Sutta, the Honeyball Sutta, that was precisely about this idea of Papancha. Remember the word Papancha from the beginning? Yeah, okay. Wow, good memory. <laughs> Long time ago now, but uh, that's good. Uh, and so uh, the idea of papancha is all the proliferation, all the thinking uh, that evolves or comes out of this idea of I. Once you have an I, then you're going to think about yourself yeah, in relation to others, uh, who you are. Your reputation becomes important. If someone says something bad about you, you get upset. Why? Because it's me, 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 uh, all about I. So I making leads to endless proliferation, endless thinking about your identity and who you are, and these kind of things. So papancha is a papancha machine, the I. Pancha machine. Mm. So, uh, <laughs> so this is why I making stops is good. Yeah, no papancha. Uh, none of these drivers in the mind that create all these thoughts that is so disturbing, uh, that stops your meditation from becoming peaceful. Uh, that the, distorts the reality of experience, that stops you from seeing other people with metta and compassion, uh, that has all of these detrimental uh, uh, side effects. Uh, in fact, the, uh, I was just uh, teasing people down the bottom this morning, uh, you were probably there, most of you, uh, and I was saying, you know, I wasn't going to say about uh, the root cause of conflict in the world. Uh, well, this is basically the root cause, yeah, the eye-making, the I. This is kind of where it comes down to uh, Still have to come next year, but uh, at least you have. Uh, <laughs> at least, you know, it's fair, it's good to know that. Uh, so it's a root problem in Buddhism. Uh, and that's why the idea, the, uh, you know, insight of stream entry is to see the Sakaya Ditti. The Sakaya Ditti is like the existing, uh, uh, an existing person or an existing substance, uh, something which exists uh, all the, at all times. Uh, Mind makings will stop. So mind making is another of these papancha machines. Uh, yeah, we're talking about uh, uh, tanha craving uh, was one of the uh, one of the um, drivers of papancha. 
and uh, the conceit I am is a driver of Papancha and the views of the self is a driver of Papancha. Views, conceit and craving. Yeah. And so mind-making is very similar to craving. Yeah. This is mine. Yeah. And uh, we endlessly think about things that are ours. Uh, yeah. This is my stuff. Uh, and how to accumulate more, how to look after it. Uh, oh, it's such a burden. Uh. Remember that famous nice story in the Ratapala Sutta? Uh, why you know Ratapala Sutta? Uh, yeah? And uh, where uh, Ratapala uh, comes back to his, uh, his parents' house and they have two piles of gold. Uh, yeah? And, uh, and the Ratapala says, well, if you wouldn't mind, household, he says, I'll tell you what to do with that gold. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, exactly. And and so and his dad is not pleased. Yeah, okay, tell me, I, whatever, just tell me. And uh, then uh, he says, yeah, if I were you, I'd take these piles of gold, put them into large sacks, load the sacks onto cards, drive the cards into the middle of the Ganges and chuck all the gold into the river, into the river Ganges. That's what I would do. And his dad was not impressed. Yeah, <laughs> You can imagine, that's what happens when you have a son who is an arahant. Yeah, it's pretty traumatic to have an arahant son uh, because they tell you things you don't want to hear. They tell you, throw the gold into the river Ganges. What are you talking about, son? You, you used to be reasonable before. Now you turn completely nuts you, when you turn into an arahant. Arahants are crazy people. <laughs> and this is the thing, right? If you are really, if you have gone a long way on this path, you do appear a bit nuts sometimes to people. You know, some of these people, you meet some of these uh, people who are really advanced, really good meditators, and they seem a bit crazy sometimes. They say things that are really wacky here. Yeah? And uh, sometimes you just have to listen and say, okay, I don't know. And then you go with the flow. And then next thing you do, you throw your gold in the river Ganges. Uh, in the river Klang, I mean, you throw, you throw your gold in the river Klang. <laughs> the river Klang, okay. So someone else would suffer, you mean? Yeah, okay. So what should you do then? Uh, take, give it to the monastery. Uh, yeah, so corrupt the monastery properly with lots of gold. <laughs> 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 yeah, you do. <laughs> okay, so you get the idea of mind making, right? Too much gold, that's mind making. So um, let's go on to the next one here. I will have unshared knowledge. Yeah, this is kind of nice. Unshared here means not shared with the common people or the ordinary people. Uh, you're kind of going into a different level, the plane of the noble ones. Uh, and so you have unshared knowledge, unshared uh, with the rest of the world, the perception of non self is not what most people uh, do. Yeah, it is kind of beyond what ordinary people. And unshared knowledge, why? It's not the fact that you want to have an ego. Yeah, my knowledge is different from yours. I am better. That's not really the point here. The point is just that when you have a knowledge that is uh, beyond the ordinary people, uh, it means we can also expect to have greater happiness and greater understanding than ordinary people. That's why this unshared knowledge is useful. Uh, if all you have is the shared knowledge of the world, well, then you're stuck like with everyone else. Yeah? And you kind of have the same problems, the same issues as everyone else. Uh, so the here, unshared knowledge means knowledge above uh, everyone else, beyond the ordinary. Uh, unshared knowledge. Uh, I will clearly see causes uh, and will clearly see phenomena that arise from causes. Uh, yeah? So... Why, why, what, what is this about? What this is about is that uh, as long as there is a sense of self, uh, there is a feeling that some things are permanent. Yeah, that's what the sense of self is. Uh, and those things that are felt to be permanent, felt to be stable, felt to have an inherent existence, uh, you will not be able to understand them in terms of causes. Uh, because the feeling that you have, the perception that you have, goes against that. Uh, and so this is why this is important. Once you take away the sense of self, you can actually see the causality of everything. You can see how things exist according to causes and how phenomena, all phenomena, including your sense of self, sense of self is this illusion arisen from previous illusion, self-sustaining delusion. Avidja begets avidja. Delusion begets more delusion. Yeah, this is the problem of the world. It's all very, very hard to escape. Because delusion begets delusion. And so often the only escape is to have someone who teaches you, actually, there is an alternative. And that's why the Buddhas are so useful in the world. That's also why it is so hard to become a Buddha. 
why there is no path there. It just happens occasionally, every now and again, randomly, someone, because of cause and conditions, they happen to become a Buddha. But very rare, because it's uh, hard to see these things. So, <laughs> what does that mean there? Confuse everyone here? No? Anyone? No? Are you sure? Yeah, maybe, maybe. We have a chance to ask more questions later on. So if you are confused, please ask questions. And if, if all you want to say, I am confused, that's okay. Okay as well. And we'll try to deconfuse you here. <laughs> so seeing these six benefits is quite enough to establish the perception of not-self in all things without qualification. So uh, there you are. This is quite maybe profound in many ways. Well, actually, it is very profound, but uh, it's nice to have some idea about uh, what is going on here. So uh, that is that. Lives, there was only one sutta left for this retreat. Uh, that is the Anatalakana Sutta, the characteristics of non-selves. Before we get onto that one, let's do a little bit of meditation together. Uh, Ajahn, uh, regarding this morning's sutra, you mentioned that uh, radiating metta starting from oneself, you, you're sort of not into it. Okay, I have two comments to make about this. Uh, firstly, it is common knowledge and acceptance in the therapeutic community that if one does not heal oneself, one cannot heal others. If one does not love oneself, one cannot love others. Mm. I think that is the basis why it is good practice to start from oneself mm. and radiate it out. Mm. And the second thing is, if we are looking at it as a form of radiation, uh, then it's just like uh, in a pool where in a pool where you drop a stone, and the the radiation starts from the point where the right. stone hits, and and it radiates out. So if we really want to radiate out, it has to radiate from a, the, the source where we, where we are standing. And finally, the last comment I want to make is that if you look at related sutras on metta, like the Metta Nisamsa Sutra about the 11 benefits, every single one of them point to benefits to oneself. Yeah. You know, it's, it's uh, not as if it's a benefit to all. It's yeah. always centered on the oneself. Yeah. So assuming therefore then, that the practitioner uh, is involved in the whole process of radiating. So radiating to oneself probably is a good starting point. Yeah, okay. Uh, yeah, I, I don't think, I don't have a problem with that. I think if uh, people, you know, if that works for people and they uh, can make that happen, then I think yeah, no, no problems at all. I think it's perfectly fine to do it that way. My point was more just to point out that I, it doesn't seem to be based on the sutta. That was more my point. Uh, and just because it isn't based in a sutta doesn't make it wrong. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's kind of that's a different issue. Yeah. So uh, I would say if whatever works for somebody, if you try it and it works, I mean, it, there's always a bit of creativity in this uh, process of meditation anyway. Nothing is kind of, there's no such thing as just following the word of the Buddha and that's the end of the story. We have to add the little bits and pieces because the information in the suttas is not complete. Yeah, the bits and pieces missing. Yeah. So... Uh, yeah, no, so just do, do what works. My point was also simply that we don't necessarily have to follow that thing. I know some people don't, uh, they don't gel with the idea of, you know, doing to oneself. They actually prefer, they have more better effect if they do it to others. Uh, and so that would be, that would depend, I think, maybe a bit on the person. Uh, and, uh, you know, I, uh, yeah, and the, the last one, the benefits of metta, I think that those benefits are there, even if you just have been metta for others, you know, I mean, you are kind of included in universal metta, so you will certainly be included in that anyway. So, uh, but uh, I take your point, Billy, and I think, yeah, I think it's, uh, it's a very valid point. Uh, and uh, so people, uh, you know, having goodwill for oneself is obviously important. Uh, um, I'd like to... Yeah. Um, add something um, it could be I don't know I'm, I'm just thinking it could be you know when, when you are radiating to others actually the whole world is a reflection of what's in your mind now when you radiate to yourself and to others 
you are creating that duality <clears throat> and uh, it's difficult for you to break out of the self. It could be that. I'm, I'm just trying to, to think about that way. Yeah, I, yeah. I, think, I think it depends to a large degree on the, where you are, how profound that meditation is. Yeah, I think that in the end, certainly, that non-duality is really important. Yeah? When the metta gets taken a long way, you break down all of those boundaries. Uh, but uh, sometimes when you start out, you may start out with more of a duality because that's what the mind is anyway. The mind is there in duality. So I think it depends on how profound your meditation is and these kind of things. Uh, but I think that's also a valid point. So yeah, so thank you for that. Yes, why Yen? Um, Ajahn, yeah. uh, dare I ask if we can summarize this AN 6.104 as the Asmimana for the first three, and yeah. the last two, is it yeah. just Kama? The Seeing the causes? First three, Asmimana, yeah, yeah, I would agree with that. I, actually, one of them is also uh, Ahankara, the Ahankara mind making Asmimana. is more like, uh, yeah. Um, yeah, more like me, but yeah, it's part of the, um, yeah. And the last, the last two are Kama, Vipaka. Yes. Clearly seeing causes and condition uh, of the phenomena. Um, Thank you. I will clearly see causes of phenomena that arises from causes. Uh, is that about, it certainly would include uh, Kamavipaka. Is it only about Kamavipaka? Uh, um, it's probably mostly relating to dependent origination. Dependent origination is, uh, I would say, mostly about Kamavipaka. Uh, that's kind of the main thing of it, uh, yeah? Yeah, so you're probably close to the truth, I would say. Yeah. Yep. Uh, Ajahn, this is just a comment about yeah. uh, brother that mentioned about the meta radiating from, uh, from for, for, first from self and mm. outward. Mm. So uh, I, my, my daughter loves uh, meta meditation, mm. but her issue was she's very angry with herself. So she couldn't do the meta on her own. Yeah. So what she did was she, she read it to animals. She loves animals. Yeah. And from there, she was able to kind of bring it back to herself. Okay, yeah. So yeah. I think different mind yeah. with a different yeah. approach. Yeah, yeah. I agree. Yes. Yeah. Good, you. yeah. It's good to have, yeah. It's good to have a flexibility, yeah. Excellent. Uh, 